Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, I should say. Um, it's wonderful to see you all here. Thank you very much for coming this evening. It's good to see a nice full audience here at the Royal Geographical Society for our Earthwatch uh, lecture. Uh, well, it's not a lecture, actually. It's a discussion more than a lecture. We'll have a few presentations and then a chance to talk on the subject of um, how can we conserve rainforests as suppliers seek to meet increasing demand for palm oil. The, the underlying aim of Earthwatch is actually fairly straightforward. What we aim to do is to promote the science base for policy making. Um, we're concerned that sometimes scientific information is lacking for policy making and we need more. We're also concerned that sometimes there's actually quite a lot of scientific evidence that gets ignored. All of us in this room enjoy the products of the oil palm, an incredible plant, amazingly productive, enormously helpful, healthy for us in many, many ways. Um, and um, we benefit from its products. Many other people benefit from actually growing the stuff and have been brought out of poverty and brought into the mainstream economies of the countries where, where, this, uh, where this oil palm is, is grown in plantations. So it's a huge success, but at the same time, this success, which is an exponential one, we hear that word a lot, but literally it is ten, ten times what it was in the 1980s. It is exponential. Um, means that there are questions and difficulties and trade-offs of an environmental uh, nature in particular. So I'll start off um, by showing you what we are talking about. So palm oil comes from a plant, the oil palm, it's a tree. Some people think the tree is chopped down every year and squeezed, but it's not. To those of you who don't know, what's harvested is these fruit bunches up here. And from these fruit bunches, you get these fruits, and these are squeezed to produce the oil. It's been traded within Africa since at least 3000 BC. Today, uh, palm oil is, covers 14 million hectares across the world, across 17 countries, and something like 56 million tons of palm oil is produced annually. The oil palm is grown between this narrow envelope across the globe, 10 degrees north and 10 degrees south. It can grow above or below that, but it's best grown within this narrow band. Now let me show you where that band lies in relation to biodiversity. So this is a map of uh, mammal species biodiversity. So the redder it is, the more biodiverse the regions. So what you can see here is an overlap of where palm oil is grown and where the most biodiverse regions are. And that is why you see in the popular media today the conflict that's often played out very publicly and sometimes uh, played out a, a bit too much in my opinion. But it is a conflict between development and biodiversity. And that is where you will see this link, linking between the palm oil industry and the destruction of important habitats for the orangutans, tigers, and rhinos. And of course, in the face of this kind of uh, news out there, the well-intentioned public, like you and I, will want to find, find out who's causing these problems and bring them to account for their actions. However, if we really think hard about it, if we really search our souls, we are also to blame because we love the stuff. Half of what you see in supermarkets have palm oil. So, one would think that we should feel a bit guilty of all this destruction. But let me show you another map. So, 10 degrees north and 10 degrees south again. Where does palm oil development lie in the face of poverty? So here you see Within that space, it's also the world's poorest countries. The darker pink it is, the more poor, poorer the region is. And you will notice that Malaysia is very light pink, and it's classified as upper middle income. Indonesia is lower middle income. And this region here is all low income. Now, you would imagine, so Malaysia and Indonesia supplies 85% of the world's palm oil. And a lot, there's a lot of research done that says that palm oil or oil palm 
is responsible for lifting many people out of poverty in these regions, in Malaysia and Indonesia. And I'll tell you why. Um, for several reasons. The top reason is infrastructure. No government, in my mind, could have brought rural development in a more efficient manner than the palm oil sector. The palm oil industry builds great quality infrastructure, mainly because the plant that you saw earlier on has an economic lifespan of 25 years. So when you build infrastructure to support that industry, you build something that lasts 50 years because everybody plans for two rotations. So you build roads, roads, schools, hospitals, put in electricity to last for at least 50 years. Very different from large-scale agriculture that is uh, based on annual crops. Secondly, oil palm has extremely high yields. And it's one of the few, and probably I would say the only commodity that allows smallholders to come out of poverty. I don't believe, and I have never seen myself, rich coffee, cocoa, cotton, sugar, soy smallholder. I have seen many rich palm oil smallholders. And it's a simple fact that the plant is very efficient. It produces a lot of oil and therefore a lot of revenue. Here it shows the efficiency of the crop. You can see here that palm oil is an extremely efficient crop. It's four to ten times more efficient than all other oilseed crops. What that means is, by consuming palm oil, you actually spare the world from looking, for looking for more land to satisfy our needs for edible oil. So this meant that producers, processors, and traders, consumer goods manufacturers, retailers, financiers, environmental NGOs, social NGOs, got together in 2004 and formed an organization called the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. They came together and agreed on a common vision, a vision to transform markets to make sustainable palm oil the norm. These unlikely partners sat down to develop a standard that would define what sustainably developed palm oil was about. This happened in 2005, and in 2008, the first certified palm oil arrived on the market. So what does it mean? What does certified sustainable palm oil mean? Well, in simplistic terms, it means that palm oil is produced legally, that no primary forest was converted to develop this palm oil, that no habitat for rare, threatened, and endangered species were cleared for this palm oil, and that the local community freely consented to these developments. To date, the RSPO has more than 1,500 members from 70 countries. We have the largest companies in the world, the largest NGOs in the world within our umbrella. And we also have smallholder cooperatives, community-based groups as well in our membership. We will definitely need the help of the scientific community to provide some level of checks on whether the RSPO is really achieving on the ground impacts that we want to achieve. We need the scientific evidence that will provide objective discussion in keeping the RSPO standards relevant. More importantly, we need you, the consumer, to help pull the supply chain of certified sustainable palm oil. And remember, the solution is not to remove palm oil from the food equation. It would be disastrous. The solution is to find a way to have palm oil develop in the right place, in the right time, in the right way. You and I have the power to ensure that it does. Thank you very much. In 2008, there was a huge corporate event that created the Sime Derby of today. We became the world's largest producer of palm oil. At that point in time, the leadership of the company came together and decided that we are going to drive the sustainability story in Sime Derby. We decided in 2008, which is just six years ago, that we would go for 100% certification. Today, this has not been reported actually, but today, we are 96% certified sustainable palm oil. This is the amount of land in the global agriculture. It's about 5 billion hectares. 68% of that is livestock industry. 32% is crop planting. And that's about, that 32% translates to about 1.5 billion hectares, of which oilseed crops account for 18% or 260 million hectares. Now, of this 260 million hectares, oil palm accounts for just 
that 5% is about just slightly under 17 million hectares, and it produces 60 million tons of palm oil. Now, that's here. That's the 16 million tons, of which 16% is certified sustainable palm oil. The rest of it is not. And of the 16%, about a quarter of it is produced by Saim Dhabi. Okay. So for us, no, sustainability is not a project. It is who we are. And my biggest challenge is the headlines. Now, I just ran through three slides with you that told you who Saim Dhabi is. But these headlines come up very often, and they don't tell you anything of what I did just now. I'm not saying that none of these things are true, but they're not necessarily, necessarily accurate either. The other challenge that we face is the changing landscape. Now, this is a tough one. If you asked Mr. Syme and Mr. Darby, where can you plant up, they would have said everywhere. But today, that's so different. I met someone, the head of R&D, from one of the large Indonesian players on Monday. And he said, there are areas in Indonesia today where 40 to 50% of plantation areas cannot be developed because of RSPO rules. Now, anyone who does business here, you will understand that if you can't plant up half of your land bank, your land cost has doubled. Your return on investment has decreased. That is a challenge. This used to be a very easy question to answer. Today it's not. We have community rights to land, and we have to address these issues almost on a daily basis. In Saim Dhabi, our solution was to set up something new. We learned this from Liberia. We have something called a social team, and we like the work that the social team is doing so much that we're replicating it and we're doing it everywhere else. This is another one who is watching us. Today, that's everybody all the time. People tweet, people watch, people talk, and because of how fast the news flows, it's not always accurate, and we have to deal with it. The more discerning customer. Now, I'm a more discerning customer. I want to know where my food comes from, so this is not necessarily a bad thing. They keep us on our toes, but it is a challenge, and we face it every day. Investor attention. When we did roadshows 10 years ago, investors wanted to know how much money we're going to make, how much in dividends we're going to pay them. Today, they also want to know how much money we're going to make and how much in dividends we're going to pay them, but they also want to know what our emission standards are, what, what our carbon footprint is, how do we manage water, what is our FPIC process, that's free prior informed consent, how are we dealing with local communities. They want to know all of this, and at the same time, they want even more money and growth. So that's a challenge. I don't need to go into this uh, changing climate. We all know what that does. And finally, the moving goalpost on what sustainability is. We knew when we signed up to this that sustainability was a journey, that the goalpost was going to move. It's about improving standards. It's about forever moving forward. It's about getting better. That's what it is. But sometimes the goalpost moves really fast, and very practical considerations like the infrastructure that you need to support us is not present. So it looks like we are reneging on commitments that we have made, this is a very practical consideration, and it's something that we face all the time. But the truth of the matter is, there's always an us and a them. Depending on who you are, you're an us, and everybody else is a them. And we end up working in silos. We don't always work together. And as a result of that, we face all the challenges that I'm talking about. I think that if we all work together, instead of against each other, we would get a lot further, a lot faster. So our program is based in, uh, in Sabah, uh, which occupies about 10% of the island of Borneo. Sabah is a great place to do uh, research. There's still lots of forest there. Uh, Sabah retains something like 50% of natural forest cover, so all of the, most of the coloured areas on this map uh, show natural forest. 
uh, it still retains a significant fraction of uh, pristine uh, forest. Uh, so the dark green areas, um, the, uh, these mustardy coloured areas, the red areas uh, are, are all primary forest. Um, in comparison to the UK, uh, UK has about 10% forest cover, maybe a little bit less than that even, uh, with virtually no primary habitat left at all. So um, Sabah's not doing too badly for, uh, for forest cover. Um, significant areas of that forest, though, have been fragmented, uh, and there are significant areas under oil palm cultivation. So about 3.5 million hectares of forest in total, uh, about 1.5 million hectares uh, of oil palm plantations. So uh, much of the unshaded area on this map uh, is now occupied by oil palm plantations. But really, in many senses, the, the, the sort of battle for primary forest um, uh, from a conservation perspective um, is now over in Malaysia um, and over large parts of Indonesia as well. Uh, most of the areas of primary forest that can be conserved already have been. Uh, certainly in Malaysia, virtually no primary forest now remains outside of fully protected areas. So just to be clear, that's not that Malaysia doesn't support any primary forest. It does. There are still very significant areas of pristine forest in Malaysia, uh, but very, very little uh, outside of protected areas. So the biodiversity, the ecosystem functioning, the ecosystem services that we associate with forests is now being supported for the most part, by either very degraded forest, and there's masses of that across Southeast Asia, um, so forest that has been often very severely logged repeatedly, um, and or in fragmented habitats, so forest that has been um, fragmented by the development of uh, plantations. And over recent decades, as we've heard from Daryl and Leela, uh, much of that conversion uh, of forest, of natural habitat, has been to oil palm plantations for all of the reasons that they've highlighted in terms of productivity and, and profitability. No government, realistically, can maintain all of its uh, land area under natural uh, cover, under pristine cover. That's not going to happen. Um, equally, the consequences of rampant, uncontrolled development uh, would be environmentally catastrophic. Uh, so, this is really, pragmatically, uh, where uh, our research is looking to contribute. Uh, in this space here, um, you know, in a sense, uh, the point at which you can have your cake and at least eat some of it. Over the last five years, we've been working with, uh, with Earthwatch on a project that's been funded by, uh, funded by Shell um, that's looking at sustainability, really, across uh, the changing landscapes of Saba. Uh, so with research going on um, along a landscape gradient, if you like, uh, from primary forest through continuous logged forest into forest patches within oil palm plantations and within oil palm plantations themselves. So the main species of tree uh, in the forests of Borneo, for those that are a bit more familiar uh, with these systems, these are the diptrocarps, these very distinctive uh, trees that dominate the forests of Southeast Asia. It appears that these are not regenerating um, in forest patches of much less than 100 hectares, uh, which is very worrying. I mean, if you think of European systems and, and UK agricultural landscapes, 100 hectares will be a fairly big patch. Um, but it appears that these trees are... Um, um, their, their recruitment is failing in these patches. Um, we're working very closely with uh, not just the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil, but the industry as well, in developing a, an impact study, essentially, um, that is going to look at all facets of the palm oil industry um, uh, under the sensor banner, socially and environmentally sustainable oil palm research, um, which will look at, as I say, many facets of the, uh, of the industry, uh, both environmental as well as uh, social uh, issues, and really uh, by addressing these, these themes that, that, uh, um, that I've put up on this slide, um, uh, seek to provide a very sound evidence base um, uh, for the future development of the palm oil industry, to underpin its sustainability, and really to try and establish whether, um, whether RSPO 
is delivering what it says on the tin. Um, I've got a question which I suppose is two parts. Uh, the first part is, Daryl, you mentioned that the EU is going to focus on labelling or SPO. My first part of my question is, what about other governments and other major countries which consume palm oil? What are they doing? And the second question is, what's the price differential between sustainable palm oil and unsustainable palm oil? It's, uh, what about the other countries, right? And the second part of it is, what's the price differential? So let me answer the price differential question. I can't answer you, the price differential question, because um, we in the RSPO, we, we can't talk about prices. It's the, you know, the anti-competition law and stuff like this. We have the world's largest producers under our umbrella and the largest buyers under our umbrella. So in some senses, uh, some ways, people can describe us as an oil cartel. <clears throat> So the OPEC of palm oil. But we're not, we don't talk about prices. However, I do know in general terms that the price differential does not matter much in terms of how the end product is priced. Uh, so far, those who have used uh, certified sustainable palm oil have not transferred that cost to the consumer. And I don't think they want to anyway. So... Um, so in other words, I don't think the price differential is that high. What about the other countries? I get this a lot. And it's one of my, I guess, the, the, the big question, right? Uh, do we need to be as good as our neighbours or do we just do good ourselves without looking at our neighbours? So I think we have lots of headroom in the EU. Uh, we've done research and we think we're not there yet in terms of the EU. I would, I would like to see much more uptake from Europe a much more uptake from the US uh, and, and from Australia, example. And then for the longer term, we look at China and India. I believe that if these markets, the US, Europe, Australia, Malaysia, Indonesia, if we convert these markets to only use certified sustainable palm oil, India and China will be inspired and will move. So yep. you said that um, by the end of this year, the, it will be... Um, a requirement in the EU to declare whether oil in food is palm oil. Do you think now um, producers think it's more beneficial to keep it as vegetable oil than it's listed as palm oil because a lot of consumers won't realise, they'll probably have heard of palm oil, but it won't necessarily connect that vegetable oil is probably palm oil? So we are already seeing signs that uh, the take-up of certified sustainable palm oil will be increasing um, this year. Uh, this year is a big year for RSPO, this year and next year, because this year the European Union uh, rules on labelling comes into play, and next year, uh, 2015, is a year that uh, most, a lot of companies and countries have set as targets to convert all the procurement to, towards certified sustainable palm oil. So it's a big year this year and next year, and I think this year we are already showing signs that we are at record levels of uptake. So it's so far good news this year. Just, to, just to, I just want to clarify something. We talk, there's two sorts of labelling here that have come up. I'm not quite sure we're not confusing them. One is the EU is going to require that it says palm oil. It's not going to require that it says sustainable palm oil, is it? No. no, no. So that's a different thing. So we just say it's palm oil. That's going to be regulated um, in law in Europe. Um, but whether it says whether it's got Daryl's logo is a second level of labelling. Let's have some more questions, please. Yeah, you've got... Yes, you, sir, that's right. Yeah. Uh, Simon Council from the Rainforest Foundation, UK. Um, some answers, perhaps, rather than questions. Um, in answer to the, perhaps the first question that you raised, of where is the palm oil industry going next, um, every projection that I have seen in terms of where it's going in market terms is continued rapid growth, and especially in precisely those markets where it's rightly been pointed out, the RSPO has almost no sway whatsoever, i.e. China... Uh, and India, and to a lesser extent the European Union, in the expectation that the yeah. 
miserable biofuels rules um, in the EU are going to create huge markets for um, palm oil as a, a fuel here. Um, where, it, where the planters are going geographically, I feel like our organization must have failed a little bit in this over the last year because, as we showed in a report last year, it's going back to Africa. And um, this is where we see some of the real weaknesses, I think, of the, of the reliance on the RSPO system becoming very evident. At the moment, there's upwards of a million hectares of pristine rainforest being threatened and already cleared in the Congo Basin region and great habitat, a great ape habitat being lost by the tens of thousands of, of hectares every week for new palm oil plantations. The RSPO can do nothing whatsoever about this, of course, because even buying certified palm oil, well, those plantations that are now clearing um, rainforest won't be, even produce palm oil that could even possibly be certified for another five or six years. So that market-based approach simply isn't going to work. And this has been something that's been flagged up a couple of times in passing in the discussion here of another couple of weaknesses of, of the RSPO system. That is the infrastructure, the fantastic infrastructure that was rightly uh, mentioned that the, the palm oil industry can, can contribute. The impacts of that uh, in places like the Congo Basin region that the palm oil industry is bringing is again not assessed in RSPO certification. It can involve the construction of hundreds of kilometers of road through pristine rainforest, opening up for illegal logging, poaching, and other non-certified palm oil companies. The whole problem, moreover, and it was rightly said um, by the gent gentleman from Earthwatch, is what we need is a, a planned landscape-based approach. The RSPO cannot and will not do that. That is only the ability of governments to do so. Okay. And in, in, in presenting a voluntary corporate approach, a market-based approach to trying to deal with this problem, we're precisely undermining the, the likelihood that governments will ever act and plan landscape um, and developments in the way that we all believe needs to happen. I, I don't have any particular knowledge of, of the situation in Africa. I mean, obviously what you're saying about a landscape level approach is, is absolutely crucial. Uh, and you're right, that, that, that is very difficult to deliver through RS, RSPO, as I'm sure Daryl will, will acknowledge. Um, uh, that The work that we're doing, a lot of the work that we do as part of our program, although more relevant to, um, to the Southeast Asian scenario, of course, um, is, is trying to underpin exactly that type of, uh, of decision making, you know, which are the crucial areas to maintain under natural forest cover. Um, you know, what is a sensible pattern of, of connectivity um, connectivity look like so at that level I, I yeah, completely, a completely agree that, that those sorts of um, uh, issues absolutely have to be addressed by, by government and, and, okay Leela is this, is, is this gentleman touching on is this a part of the world where you think we're going to see some big change uh, some big plantations probably uh, we yeah. are in Liberia as most people probably know that um, there are a lot of companies, a lot of corporates that we are aware of who are actually entering various countries in Africa as well. Um, I can't speak for any of them. I can, I can speak for Saim Dhabi. If it's a primary forest, if it's a high conservation value area, we will not clear it. It's as simple as that. Okay. Mm. And Daryl, what's preventing uh, RSPO from being successful in the areas that we're talking about? Uh, the if fact any. that 50% of our certified products are not taken up. Okay. But... Let me come back to this, this thing about the Congo clearance of one million hectares or so, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's highly unlikely that an RSPO member today is going to clear that kind of areas in the Congo. I can tell you why. We've stopped development in several countries in Africa by our uh, RSPO members, including Saim Dhabi. We stopped. We stopped uh, companies in Liberia, Cameroon, uh, where's the other place? I can't remember. A few other countries. We've terminated one company. We, all RSPO members know that when they enter into Africa, their standards must remain the same as where they operated in um, uh, Indonesia or Malaysia because the RSPO standards doesn't recognize boundaries. We treat it, uh, we, we, uh, it's uniform across any geography. And we impose, because of our policy, that we, we must be informed of any development prior to any clearance. And we can stop development as per the rules of our membership. However, 
we can't, obviously we can't stop non-members. And there are many companies out there who are clearing uh, lands in Africa. Now having said that, several countries have approached now the RSPO to talk about absorbing our policies into their country level policies. Right. Um, I, I was surprised last year that the UN Security Council wrote to me uh, and I thought it was, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, those email fraud stuff. You know, I got an email saying I'm from, I'm from the UN Security Council. We want to meet up. And I thought, well, it's another Nigerian or something <laughs> email scheme. Okay. Right, but then I got a, a sealed letter. And basically what they wanted to tell me was we would like the RSPO to ensure that your policies are enforced in Africa because we think the RSPO policies is crucial to avoid uh, uh, to, to avoid sparking up conflict in post-conflict nations, recently uh, post-conflict yeah. nations. Yeah. Okay. So we, we do influence at that level. We cannot solve the problems, but together with governments, we can. Okay. Oh, we, go ahead, briefly. Yeah. All of this is assisted, of course, if you're fairly confident that, that the guidelines are delivering what they say on the tin. Um, so I'd put a plug in there for um, you know, putting in place a much more robust evidence base. Okay. We clearly have a very complex situation here. Um, it seems to me there's a geographical complexity that we only just touched on, uh, which is that in some parts of the world you've got one particular market situation and governance situation. In other parts of the world it's a bit, uh, a bit more like the Wild West and a totally different situation. Um, and, and things are going to have to sort of progress as they always have uh, geographically across, across different zones and in different ways. But what we have seen, I think, tonight is that... Um, there are some um, fundamental approaches which are very important. Um, partnership, it always gets trotted out, but it does, we've heard it tonight, it's very, very important um, about the, the roundtable, which is a partnership, after all, between um, uh, NGOs and between corporate partners as well. So it's not a kind of ding-dong organisation. I've got a strong feeling it is a consultative and um, consensual organisation that is looking to find a way ahead step by step, in a step by step way and of course that's always going to be too slow it's always going to be too slow, bound to be but they're doing it and they're, 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 pu they're pulling it forward, that seems to me to be a, a very good thing and really demonstrates what this sort of partnership's all about so thanks very much to all of you particularly for your questions, I'll now hand over to Sue Holden who's the uh, Chief Executive of Earthwatch to, for a vote of thanks and, thank you thank you Glenn, Leela and Daryl, thank you very much for your presentations. They were absolutely brilliant. Mark, thank you very much for chairing so deftly. I think, as we've just heard, the evening's shown again, um, that it's really important to create a neutral space where we can bring together different perspectives on really complex global issues. Um, and we're delighted that so many of you joined us here and a lot of people on the, the live webinar. Thank you very much for coming.